continuing to look at Ephesians chapter 2 to see what it is that the Holy Spirit is communicating through the Apostle Paul and to the churches, to us. Let me just read this whole passage from verse 11 down through verse 22. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for He is our peace, who hath made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far, afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in which all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together, for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So for nearly 2,000 years, the world has been experiencing the truth that Paul is teaching in the passage before us. As we went into in some detail last week, prior to the cross of Jesus Christ, God had established a division among the nations. God did that. A division among the nations. By way of the commonwealth of Israel, the covenants of promise, and the law of commandments in ordinances, a distinction was made between that nation that he called his and the rest of the world. And you can read about it in Deuteronomy, you can read, read about it in a number of places, but Deuteronomy 4 clearly outlines that it's, there's no nation like that nation that received the things that that nation received, that was distinguished like that nation was distinguished. Until the time of Reformation. Hebrews 9 and verse 10, which we read earlier. And at that time, something happened. The New Testament church, inclusive of saved and among the Jew and Gentile. Listen, that is not an afterthought of God. The New Testament church is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It is the unfolding of the mystery of God in Christ Jesus. Look at chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 3. How that by revelation He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you 
read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Paul wrote of this in the Roman letter as well. I want to read from Romans chapter 15, beginning at verse 7. Because this, this is so, it aligns so well with the thought that Paul is making in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 7, because remember the, the, the Roman saints included Jew and Gentile, just like in the Ephesian church, primarily Gentile, but Jews were there. In verse 7 of Romans 15, he says, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, salvation is of the Jews, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written. For, and and this, this is the Old Testament spoke of this. Long before it ever occurred. This is not an afterthought. This is prophecy fulfilled. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse. And he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles Trust. The New Testament church then, this is important to understand, the New Testament church is not some oddity, not some peculiarity in the history of God and the outworking of God's purpose and plan. It's not an interruption. It's not a, a parenthesis until he gets back to what he was really all about. The New Testament church is the manifestation of the wisdom and the glory of God. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent... That now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. I mean, this is the grand display of God to even that unseen realm. That it might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Who would have ever thought that Jew and Gentile could ever survive together in the same body? According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And skipping to verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. And more literally translated. Unto him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Through all ages. World without end or even in Christ Jesus. In other words apart from Jesus Christ there is no church. And it makes no difference whether you are a Jew or a Gentile if you're apart from Christ Jesus. So coming back to our text and thinking about the Apostle Paul, the context in which he is writing, it is very significant. You see, Paul's ministry was in the transition time of this Reformation that Hebrews talked about the time of Reformation. It came, but there was a transition time from the Old Covenant to the New. The outworking of that. When national Israel... See, this is when Paul is writing at a time when national Israel was blinded 
And they could not see the fulfillment of the law and prophets in Christ, in Jesus Christ. By the way, Gentiles who are blinded today can't see either. But as a nation, we know from Scripture, we're not going to go researching that in the message this morning. But as a nation, they're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And we're not going to go into that in Romans 11. But Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. Think about this. He's writing in about 62 A.D. The first time that he went to Ephesus was about 54 A.D. So about eight years have transpired. About three years earlier from the point of Paul writing this while he is in prison, he personally experienced the enmity or the hostility of Jews against the Gentiles. I want to go for sake of context, to read from Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. This was when Paul had left the brethren at Ephesus. Remember, he talked with the elders. And then he was going to Jerusalem. And it was while he was in Jerusalem that he saw this enmity, this angst, this animosity of the Jews against the Gentiles. In other words, it still existed. Now, it ended as we're going to see, by the cross, by the blood of Christ, 30, 31 A.D. But here we are, 60, 30 years later, that angst is still existing in the hearts of the Jews against the Gentiles. In Acts 21, beginning in verse 17, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Remember, there had been a great revival, or I probably shouldn't call it a revival, there had been a great outpouring of the Spirit and regenerating the hearts of many Jews on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. There were, what, at least 8,000 that were told in, in Jerusalem, in that region, who were converted. Probably more than that. So there were a lot of believers, Jewish believers. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Remember, they're working through this transition from the old to the new. These are Jews, converted Jews. Many of them. And, and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. So they're talking to Paul here. Many thousands believe. And they are all zealous of the law. So they are still living under, in the context of the mosaic mindset, mosaic economy. They're still living in that realm, in that mindset. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children. That's important because that's in our, back in Ephesians 2, that was one of the, external, the significantly external things that marked Jews, marked the nation, marked that covenant. Neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? What are we, what are we going to do? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. This was a Nazarite vow. Remember, Paul in, a, in the Corinthian letter says, to the Jews became I as a Jew. And that's what you're seeing here. You're, you're seeing this as a point. This is three years earlier from the writing of Ephesians. And he's still engaged in, in basically uh, complying with the old customs, the customs of the Mosaic Covenant. Them take, he's, they tell Paul, and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. And at this point, Paul didn't say it. It's not recorded that he said anything. Apparently the timing wasn't right to teach more fully or expose more fully. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded, this goes back to Acts 15, that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangled, and from fornication. 
Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for them, for every one of them, which was the end of the Nazarite vow. You read about that in Numbers chapter 6. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this place. For they had been, for they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian. You see that? There was an Ephesian with him. He's writing to Ephesus. An Ephesian was with him in Jerusalem. And so there's a connection whom they suppose that Paul had brought into the temple, forbidden to the Gentiles. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, well, he didn't get killed at that point. He was saved. He was given an opportunity to, to, uh, to give a message, and he did so. It's in chapter 22. And as he gave that message, everybody listened. He was speaking in the Hebrew tongue. They were amazed that he could speak in the Hebrew tongue, but he could. He gave that message, and by the end of that message, they, they listened until he got to this part. In chapter 22, verse 21, he said unto me, Jesus said unto him, he's talking about his conversion and commission, depart. For I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Do you hear the enmity there? Paul is writing this Ephesian letter addressing the glorious nature of the church, which is not Gentiles becoming Jews or joining Israel under the terms of the Old Covenant, but something new that is created by Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, and for Jesus Christ. There is now a better way that has made obsolete the old ways that marked the old covenant, which pointed to the coming of Christ, the Messiah, who now has come. There is no reason under God for any who are in Christ to experience enmity, animosity, or hostility either toward God or toward one another if we're in Christ. And that is the summary message of the verses that we've read, 11 through 22. Paul's argument, which we'll begin to enter into this morning, Paul's argument is that peace with God in Jesus Christ necessarily leads to peace with all others who are likewise in Christ. Understanding this peace is critical to life in a New Testament church. Miss this point, and the New Testament church will be something that God never intended it to be. It'll be a mess. And sadly, I believe the testimony too often in the world today, in the church, to the world, is that we're a mess. And so we need to think about the very foundation of the church, the purpose of the church, why it is we are what we are, and how it is we are to get through all of the things that would necessarily, if we were left to ourselves, divide us and splinter us into a zillion pieces filled with enmity. You know where it begins? And you know where it must continue? He is our peace. Verse 14. 
He is our peace. Now, there's a word for there. It connects us to what went before. And really, it is the transition to what follows. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And he's going to say later that the message of this Christ, this blood of Christ, is the message that goes to those who are both far off and near, Jew and Gentile. For. We are near. What does that mean? It means there is peace. For He is our peace. He is our peace. It's emphatic. He, especially if you can see the original, it's emphatic in the original language. This isn't just a passing comment. Paul is not saying He is a way to something, though He is. He is saying He is something. He is our peace. He's the reason for everything Paul is saying in this scripture here. He, Jesus Christ. He is the reason the door of faith was open to the Gentiles. He's not only the way to peace. He is our peace. What is this peace? In scripture, there's more than one idea surrounding this word peace. And I'm not going to do a study on that. Recently, we, I preached on that from 2 Thessalonians. I'm not going to go back to cover all of that ground. In this passage, he is not talking about a feeling or an emotion. He is talking about a relationship. You see that if you, if you notice the contrast between the words enmity and peace in verse 15 having abolished in his flesh the enmity that word enmity is first the first word in that verse in the original and it's being emphasized there is an enmity he is our peace answers that enmity verse 16 and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. There, there's a, a relational problem. There's a relational problem with God, and there's a relational problem with one another. He is our peace is the answer to that relational problem with God. He is our peace, is the answer to the relational problem between two opposing groups in this context, Jew and Gentile. Now we're going to make applications. So just follow, the, follow, the under, follow what the text is saying here. You notice that as he, he repeats it in verse 14, he made both one. In verse 15, for to make in himself a two, one new man, so making peace. There was a problem between the two. Now in Christ, there is no reason for that problem unless we make a reason for it. And then in verse 16, he repeats this idea, reconcile both unto God in one body. So you see, the, the thrust of this passage is about the two. It's about the two becoming one and the one becoming one. So there is the horizontal relationship restored. There is the vertical relationship restored. Restored. He is our peace. That is the first principle from which our experience of peace follows. It is seeing and understanding and grasping and it being placed within our very souls, deep within our minds and hearts, that He is our peace. Peace. Peace that is objectively established, not by anything you do, not by anything I do, but peace that is objectively established 
by Him, in Him. Peace with God. And peace in the church. And where is that peace? From what basis is that peace experienced? We're going to get back to this later on. It's at the cross. Fundamentally important. He is our peace. Remembering this truth is going to be vital to our experience of relational peace. He is our peace. Now, what has Christ done to make peace? Well, what does Paul emphasize here? He uses these sort of summary expressions, the part for the whole. He says in, in verse 13, by the blood of Christ. In verse 15, he says, in his flesh. In verse 16, by the cross. He's talking about the redemptive work of the eternal Son of God who came into this world, taking upon Himself our flesh that He might die the death that we deserve. And that He might ra rise from the dead. That's what He's talked about in chapter 2. And so that when He rose, we rose with Him and, and we are seated with Him in heavenly places. This is all accomplished by Christ and in Christ. So that, listen to this, every reason for God to oppose you has been taken out of the way by Christ. And every reason for Jew and Gentile to oppose one another has been removed by Jesus Christ. In verse 16, that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof, thereby. I go there because, listen, if there is not a vertical reconciliation, there will never be a horizontal reconciliation. If you don't have peace with God, you can't have godly, what is a godly peace with others. You will not have the relationship you ought to have with others if you do not have a relationship with God that you should have in Christ. And so he says that he might reconcile both those opposing parties, both unto God in one body by the cross, having by that cross slain. He slew it, the enmity. By the cross. So Jew and Gentile are now reconciled. There is nothing more and nothing less than the cross that reconciles us to God. Did you hear that? He is our peace with God because of what He alone has done. You say that's elementary, preacher. I hope it's not so elementary that you race past that. Remember the word. Remember the word. Remember. Isn't that what he said? Wherefore, remember. Back in verse 11. This, this is what's going to be fundamentally what's going to enable you to have peace with those that you otherwise would never be able to have peace with. But he begins... With peace with God. And He is our peace. He is our peace with God. Horatius Bonar understood that when he wrote these words. Not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. I was reading a, a, a Puritan prayer this morning, and I, I, I don't, maybe I just don't understand the context in which this person was praying what he was praying, 
But I was saying, I was, I was actually engaging and I was saying, what of Christ? What about Christ? What about Christ? All of your tears and all of your sighs and all of your prayers are not going to reconcile you to God. It will not bring peace with God. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to Thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. Amen? It's true. He is our peace in relationship to God. It's because of Him alone. Listen to me. It's because of Him alone. It is not the law. And let me just pause to say, and I'm not going to get distracted here with all of the, all of the discussions and the differences of viewpoint because it doesn't matter how you understand the law. The law is not the way to peace. It's no longer against us. We are now reconciled to God by the cross. What does verse 16 say? And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, in, in one body by the law. Is that what it says? That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the law. No, it is not the law. It's through the cross. If the law does not lead you to Christ and the cross, then there's another spirit that's using that law in your life and keeping you from peace. When the Spirit of, the, of God brings life, as Paul experienced in Romans 7, brings life, then that law takes on a whole different... You see it differently. It pierces you. You see how far short you come of the holiness of God. But it doesn't leave you there. You know you have no hope at Sinai. You flee to Calvary. You free, flee to Christ for peace. So Paul understood this and he wrote about it more than once in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's talking to Gentiles, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He uses the word us there. Listen, going back to the handwriting of ordinances is not the way to peace. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to, the, to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over, triumphing over them in it. And so nearness to God is no longer by way of carnal earthly systems or the system known as the old Mosaic Covenant, but it's by the blood of Christ. And we read that in Hebrews 9 earlier. So from God's perspective, the cross is the only way for Jew and Gentile to be reconciled to Him. And thereby the two are made one body. Any reason for enmity is gone in Christ. It's gone. Now, this is the truth. You may not be living by the truth, but this is the truth. In verse 14 and 15, Paul says, And hath broken down. I mean, listen to those words. Broken. And then in verse 15, abolished. Those are strong words. He's broken. He's dissolved. It's done. It's finished. It's not happening. It's done. He's broken down the middle wall of partition. That division is what is represented there. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. The law of commandments contained in ordinances. He's abolished that. Why? For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. He's, he's, there's something new. He says that. 
For to make, you know that word make there is the same word that's translated in chapter 4, create. It's a word for creation. It's something He has done by way of Himself. The cross, His blood, the resurrection. One new man. So making peace between those who have come to know peace with God. God in Christ. I think it's important for you to know, to think about this. There's many wrong thoughts come to people's minds when they think about these things, but God in Christ has not abolished distinctions of holiness or moral absolutes between His people and the world. Do not think that when you read Words like we're reading in verses 14 and 15, that is not the point. Back in chapter 6 of Galatians, Paul says, but chapter 6, verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. There, there is a distinction between God's people today in Christ and the world. There is a holiness about the people of God today that doesn't exist in the world. Paul here is referring to that which continued to stir up enmity between Jew and Gentile. Circumcision made with hands. We read about it in Acts 21. I'm not going to go back and read that again. The car carnal ordinances of the law that they said that Gentiles must subject themselves to. And in fact, it wasn't even enough for Gentiles to subject themselves to those things in the minds of most of the Jews. You're not a Jew. Don't dare bring them into the temple court. But God has done better than that. Christ has done better than that. Not, not only may Jews, but Gentiles not just enter into what is some physical carnal temple court, we enter into the temple Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Into the true holy of holies. The veil being rent. The law of commandments and ordinances became obsolete by His blood and by His cross. You know, there are still folks today who are they call themselves Christians, and yet they're still engaging in all of the symbolical things of that old covenant. They're still doing those things. You know, God never intended the law as the basis of our justification, even under the old covenant. <laughs> what do you think the bloody sacrifices were all about? I mean, what do you think the priestly order, what do you, who do you think Mel Melchizedek was? All of that pointed toward what was coming and what has come. The hope of Israel. He is now the one in whom the people of God are distinguished in this world. God's purpose for the old covenant is fulfilled in Christ so that now there is one new man that he has created. It is on the basis of our relationship in Christ Jesus, not the law. Listen to this. I'm going to make application here in a moment. It is on the basis of our relationship in Christ Jesus, not the law, that we have now, that we now have peace and can experience peace. It is not based upon the law in any shape or form. It is based upon our relationship in Christ Jesus. And if you don't get that by reading these verses, you're missing. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and read all the way through and see how many times you read in Him, in Him, in Him, in Him. While Jew, the Jew-Gentile enmity may not be apparent today, though I suppose it has never quite gone away, has it? It still seems to exist, anti-Semitism and so forth. 
But while we may not be in the throes of that sort of spirit, there is sufficient strife and enmity in the world that ought not to be part of a New Testament church. And peace with God and peace between us depends upon He who is our peace, our relationship in Christ and to Christ. That's the foundation from which everything else about the church must follow. He is our peace. He is our peace. He is the reason for our relationship of peace with God. There, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Attempts to make peace with God any other way than the cross of Christ is akin to circumcision made with hands. And if that's all you have, that leaves your heart untouched by Christ and you are still undone. You're unclean. You're outside. You need His Spirit in you. This was the message preached by Christ. This was the message preached by the apostles. This is the message that continues to be preached by His church. Verses 17 and 18. And came and preached peace to you which were far off. By the way, this is a quotation of Isaiah 57, 19. It was prophesied that this would happen. That the, this peace would be proclaimed to those who are far off and those who are near. And it's so interesting the way it's worded here. Paul says... It's not, remember, it was to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But do you see the flip of the order there in verse 17? Came and preached peace to you which are afar off and to them which that were nigh. You remember Paul's words in Acts chapter 15? Or was it Peter? The conclusion was that we believe that we shall be saved by the same grace of Christ that they will be saved. Who's, he Who's the they there? It's the Gentiles. We, are the, we Jews, are going to be saved the same way. The, isn't that interesting? The same way the Gentiles are. The grace of Jesus Christ. So that through Him, verse 18, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. I'm going to skip those thoughts there for, because for sake of time here. and I want to move to these closing points of application. Because you see, if we really get this, brothers and sisters in Christ, I've been struggling to get this. You say, preacher, haven't you been saved very long? I've been saved a long time. God saved me a long time ago. And I'm still struggling to get this. Okay? And I want you to struggle to get this. This is so fundamental because if we really get this, that Jesus Christ he is who He is. Our peace. He is our peace. If this gets settled into our souls in truth, it will be the reason for our relationship of peace, both with God and with one another. We will not be struggling to establish peace with God. And we will not be fighting with one another, having no peace. You see, Jesus Christ has eliminated the divisive categorization of Jew and Gentile. Jesus Christ has eliminated, by His cross, He has eliminated the divisive categorization of Jew and Gentile. But He didn't stop there. You remember what He said in the Galatian letter? Not only Jew and Greek, but bond nor free, male nor female. He has broken down those 
points of division. Asian, African, American, rich, poor, academic, non-academic. In himself, there is one new man. We're not going to get into it today. This is true broadly. But church, this is what we ought to be presenting to the world. Differences that naturally and historically stir up bigotry, and prejudice, or intolerance are abolished by the cross. And when we come together, when we come together to Him who is our peace, recognizing that His blood and His cross is the reason we have peace with God together, that changes our relationships. I don't look down upon you. I'm a man, you're a woman. Poor you. That's what the Jews thought. I mean, was that about as bad as being a dog? Being a woman. Now, God didn't teach that. We don't, we don't do that. We don't, we don't judge one another in the same way the unregenerate Jews and unregenerate Gentiles judge one another. Well, it's not that we see no distinctions. There are still Jews and there are still Greeks, Gentiles. There are still men and there are still women. There are still ethnic differences. There are still cultural differences. Those things still exist. But it's that those distinctions pale into insignificance at the cross. In Christ. At the cross, by the blood of Christ, there is no difference. We are all sinners. Equally made whole and joined together as one in Him. As new covenant believers in Jesus Christ, through Him, we have the same peace, the same reconciliation, the same message, same, the same access by the same Spirit. Our unity is based upon our union in Him. Our togetherness in Him. And it makes no difference the shade of your skin or the language that you speak. I'm talking about not English, something else. I encourage you that what Christ has torn down, do not build back up. Many things could be said at this point. I'll just give you just a few ideas as we close. And we can talk about it. We must not construct barriers to relational peace by judging or despising one another. Over things that we may have at one time had a very biblical right to do. That the cross has abolished, has destroyed. There was a time where if Paul had written some of the things that can you imagine him writing verses 14 and 15? Before Christ came, before the Messiah came. There was a time when days and diets and ceremonies and surgical procedures meant something in the economy of God. But we need to learn what Peter learned not to call common what God has cleansed, nor attempt to reinstate what God by the blood of Christ has abolished. Yeah. 
And if there are those that are still struggling because of their background, upbringing, or whatever, with days and diets and ceremonies and so forth, even surgical procedures, so long as they are not saying, this is essential for my peace with God, we need to bear with such. Not look down upon them. But we can actually dwell with them in peace. Unity. If our unity is in Christ, there's the big deal. Now, if your unity is in the law, you got a problem. And we must not build our walls and fences. He has broken down the middle wall of partition. Lloyd-Jones refers to that as barriers that we construct. Which becomes the source of enmity and division with our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been brought near to God just as near as you have been brought to God. Not by what they have constructed, but by the cross of Christ, the blood of Christ. That's the only grounds by which you have been brought near to Christ. You, you get that. And if I look at you and I see you and I engage with you and you're a brother or a sister in Christ, then there's things that I can look past. My relationship with you and your relationship with me must not be on the basis of of anything else than that which is anchored, tethered to He who is our peace. Tethered to Him. Now there are a lot of things that are tethered to Him that we, we talk about. But when those things that are tethered to Him become the thing, and that's what causes division. We have missed the point of the gospel. We have missed the point of the church. Too many issues can take precedence over our relation in Christ. Uh, Jimmy Downing preached this last week about our love waxing cold. And he just asked, simply asked the question, do you love Jesus? Do you ever talk about your love for Jesus? Do you ever talk to one another about your love for Jesus? Or would we rather talk about the things we disagree on? Which oftentimes stir up enmity. I see it on Facebook. I see it on... Some of your minds are really racing there, aren't you? It's, it's all over the place. What is it that unites us? Does homeschooling unite us? Do you understand that there are people that will not, they won't even belong to a church that doesn't emphasize homeschooling? Mask or no mask? Well, we divide, don't we? we? We take our positions. We're strong in our positions. We forget that we're in Christ together. And those kinds of things become the focus. We're building walls. Building fences. Oh, we have our reasonings. But the more, we, the more we reason, the more we get away from Christ. Politics. You are not a Christian if you vote for fill in the blank. Hello, where do you find that? Well, Dr. So-and-so said it. Dr. So-and-so is not the Word of God.
You see, when you start talking about details, it gets a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? Until you, until you remember, wait a minute, wait a minute. He is our peace. He is our peace. I may disagree with you, but I'm not going to draw swords. I'm not going to build fences. I'm not going to create enmity. Because you see, enmity was destroyed. On the cross. If I have peace with God and I'm relating to God in the context of this peace, he who I cannot see, shouldn't I relate that way with those I can see who are in Christ with me? What joins us together in peace as a church? Are we reconciled together unto God by the cross? I, I, I know. Listen, brothers and sisters, I just be speak very, I guess, very just open with you. There's sometimes I, I there's things about you that that creates tension in me. But hopefully, it doesn't destroy the peace. I don't. I know there's nothing in me that creates tension in you. I'm thankful that I'm. No, you see, that's just the way it is. That's relationships are like that. Don't let it destroy. Don't let it destroy. Don't let it destroy what was been purchased for us at the cross. Nothing else should be more important than that. But you get away from the cross and you just open the door for all kinds of problems, relational problems. This doesn't mean acceptance of all who say Jesus. Oh no, our peace is too costly. <laughs> our peace is too costly to ignore the way of righteousness under the lordship of our Prince of Peace. If the foundation of our relation to God and one another is Jesus Christ our peace, and whatever differences we may have, we will enjoy a relationship of peace that magnifies Him and not the wall, not the point of division, but Him. Not the thing that brings us together. We, we come together around fill in the blank. That's a replacement for Christ. May it not happen to us. Let's endeavor, as Paul goes on to say in chapter 4, remember that becomes the practical side of these truths. Let us endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The peace that he's talked about, that's the bond. He is our peace. Amen.